This is Anglia. It's a quarter past ten. News time from ITN. It's a new prince. He was born just an hour ago. And they got the first news. In Gibraltar, Britain opens the gate, Spain doesn't. And the bigger offer to health service workers, but the strike goes on. Good evening. It's a boy. The Princess of Wales's first baby, the next in line to the throne after Prince Charles himself, has been born at St Mary's Hospital in London. And the palace say that he was born at three minutes past nine this evening. The new prince has blue eyes like both his parents, and he cries lustily. Mother and child are both doing well, and the Prince of Wales was present at the birth. The Princess of Wales went in early this morning in the early stages of labour, and Prince Charles quickly joined her. The Queen, other members of the royal family, and most of the country waited all day for the news. And now it has arrived. From outside St Mary's, Sarah Cullen. Well, though we're not hearing Sarah Cullen, the Prince has been born. And here's an account of what happened outside St Mary's today from Alistair Stewart. At this stage, the royal guests were now settled in at St Mary's. The hospital officials and policemen worked out how they'd handle the day. For the nurses, another day's work, but with some unusual distractions. The steady flow of flowers started early, with the first well-wishers apparently hedging their bets, yellow for a boy or girl. People in the crowd thought they'd spotted something, but then maybe not. Everyone inside was, after all, rather busy. And still more flowers arrived, blue this time for a boy. The photographers roared for a better picture. No one, however, was telling who He's sent them. We've had a number of orders of flowers. Whether they're all for the princess or not, I wouldn't like to say, but the number are. I... But there was no hiding the destination of this bouquet, paid for in advance. Other items went on sale among the crowd. Strawberries and cream at 75 pence a time must have seemed a better buy than at Wimbledon. And there was no shortage of takers. Briefly, the health service pay row arrived on the scene. Marchers were politely moved on, but one nurse managed to get her message across. There's been a carnival atmosphere among the crowd, some of them sporting souvenirs of previous royal occasions. Less happy have been the pressmen, anxiously waiting for the photographs for tomorrow's front page. But would it happen in time? Flowers and yet more flowers were all they got. A pink ribbon, perhaps for a girl. But no, it seemed not, as flowers and florists were sent away. Much to the delight of one of the policemen. Well, the good-humoured crowd has been waiting on and waiting on until now. Well, the new baby born tonight will be known as His Royal Highness Prince, and then whatever the chosen name is, of Wales. He won't have any other titles until the time comes for his father, Prince Charles, to succeed to the throne. And then he'll automatically become the Duke of Cornwall and Rothsey, the Earl of Carrick, Baron of Renfrew, Lord of the Isles, and Prince and Great Steward of Scotland. The Royal Baby to be known as His Royal Highness Prince, whatever name is chosen, of Wales. The baby is now second in line of succession to the throne, after the Prince of Wales, his father, and ahead of Prince Andrew, Prince Edward, and Princess Anne. As a guide to the Christian names, the parents are likely to consider first, and we went back to all the Christian names of the House of Windsor, not just the first ones, but all the Christian names, because some members of royalty have been known by their second or third names. The most popular five were Albert, that's mainly because Queen Victoria insisted on her sons and grandsons being named after her husband, then George, Edward, Frederick, and Charles. 
The most popular boys' names on the Princess of Wales's side, that in the Spencer and Fermoy families, are John and Edmund, followed by Edward and Charles. John and Edward are also the Christian names of the Princess of Wales's father. The parents may be influenced by fashion as well as history. The top five first names in the Times birth columns last year were Thomas, James, Alexander, Edward, and William. Some other names may get special consideration too, like Louis, in honor of the late Lord Mountbatten, Philip, because the father's father normally gets a mention somewhere, and Andrew, because of an uncle who took part in the successful Falklands campaign. The man who delivered the royal baby was Mr. George Pinker, the Queen's gynecologist. He's said to be one of the top men in his profession and a firm believer in fathers being present at the birth. His patients talk of his relaxing bedside manner and his sense of humour. It was his eighth royal delivery. The Duchess of Gloucester is a particular friend of his. And Mr. Pinker on the right was this a is delivery your... of both Prince Anne, Princess Anne's children. Well, the new baby is, of course, at the centre of enormous attention, though royal children are getting used to coping with that kind of publicity. Anthony Carthew has been looking at the changes in royal upbringing lately. This is your traditional royal family picture, notwithstanding the sneeze. Yet in the 30 years since Prince Charles produced that sneeze on the lawns of Buckingham Palace, the whole lifestyle of being a royal has changed immeasurably. It's still immensely privileged, of course, and this baby will have the Palace of Kensington as the first nursery. A rather more homely palace than Buckingham, it already contains the royal cradle, which has ornately rocked royal infants from the time of Queen Victoria. Some of Victoria's toys are still there, a music box with mechanical figures, and a rather splendid toy carriage. More modern gifts have already been handed over. Booties from the brownies. An oak high chair at the design centre. A vast teddy bear. And a wobbly wooden corgi. At Prince Charles's christening, the family gathered, as every family does on these occasions, Four generations supervised in formality by Queen Mary. A quarter of a century on, when Princess Anne's daughter Zara was christened, television cameras were there to record the taking of the official pictures. The atmosphere was distinctly informal as Lord Litchfield arranged the new addition to the family album. At least the days of dressing up royal babies in a far-fetched manner are over. This was Victoria's sons Arthur and Alfred as Sikhs. Prince Leopold as Henry IV's son and Richard II. And Princess Victoria and Prince Arthur depicting summer in a tableau of the seasons at Windsor. But after all the fuss and photographs, what it's like to grow up at Royal today. Prince John. I didn't suddenly wake up in my pram one day. <laughs> I, I think it's something that dawns on you. It's the most ghastly, inexorable um, slowly that people are interested in one and slowly you get the idea that you, you have a certain duty and responsibility and, and I think it's better that way rather than suddenly someone telling you, you know, you must do this and you must do that because of who you are. I think it's one of those things you grow up in. As for royal education, things have changed dramatically since the days when Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret Rose were taught in private by a governess. Prince Charles again. I think that, that I've gone to school and university and everything uh, in, in, a, in a much more normal way than any of my predecessors did has, be, has been an experiment in, in the royal education. And of course, it has been slightly difficult. Um, and there have been disadvantages at moments when I regretted it, but I think I can say with this. So now a new member joins the family and will one day call the baby seen here Uncle Edward. And from now, the newcomer begins to prepare for a unique role in British society, a role which will change even more in the years before the newcomer comes of age in the year 2000. Both the Prince and Princess of Wales have shown in the past year that they have their own very definite ideas on parenthood. They both want as much contact with the new baby as possible, especially during its early days. 
The prince first led on that he'd like to be at the birth when he spoke to a mother in a Welsh maternity ward whose husband was present. Did you watch the... Uh, you didn't object to the... Things that I'm sure the beggars take. And he also tried some fatherly gestures. We saw the princess practicing too. She's of course perfectly qualified for the job, though the skill doesn't always work. Are you on your own? Where's your mother? <laughs> her two main jobs before her engagement both involved looking after children. First there was Patrick Robertson, an American child living in London. The princess still writes to the family who are now back in New York. Then at the kindergarten in London where she helps the teacher. From the minute she walked in you could tell that she had a really genuine love for young children, particularly the very small ones. And anyone who arrived with a baby you could guarantee that she would be there to feel the baby. Previous royal mothers-to-be have often withdrawn during their pregnancy. Not the princess, she was pregnant and proud of it. Now she will probably want to play an even more active role in looking after her child. To help her, she will have a nanny, Miss Barbara Barnes, who's 39, and the daughter of a worker on the Earl of Leicester's estate, a traditional upbringing for royal nannies. And if she needs any advice, in the background is Miss Mabel Anderson. She helped the Queen bring up both Prince Charles and Princess Anne. All this experience is there ready to be consulted. But first and foremost, it is the Prince and Princess's own child, and they mean to make all the big decisions. The first of these is what to do with the baby when they set off on a world tour, as the Prince promised in New Zealand last year. The tour is being planned for the end of this year. Of course, they may even take the baby with them. Prince Charles has rung the Queen to tell her personally, and Buckingham Palace says she's absolutely delighted. And other members of the royal family have been told, including Prince Andrew down in the Falkland Islands. The Queen Mother is said to be overjoyed, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. Robert Rumsey, says, we rejoice with them. It's good news for millions around the world, he said, who hold them in their affection and prayers. And now for the excitement outside St. Mary's Hospital, Sarah Cullen. Well, the crowd here went mad when the news broke. There was a spontaneous burst of cheering, followed by singing, for he's a jolly good fellow. And then there were shouts of, we want Charlie, we want Charlie. Champagne corks immediately began popping, and there was wave after wave of cheering, singing and shouting. And indeed, everyone now seems to be settled in here for an all-night party. We're not going until Prince Charles comes out, they shouted, and began singing again. As you can hear, they shouted, it's a boy, it's a boy. Well, the mood here has been building up all day, and everyone here is now waving Union Jack. As you can hear, cheering and cheering in the background, and toasting the health of the new baby. Sarah Cullen, News at 10, with the cheering crowd outside St Mary's Paddington. The Princess's father, Al Spencer, heard the news at his home in Grosvenor Square in London tonight. Tim Ewart spoke to him. Marvellous, congratulations. Yes. Wonderful news. Very yes. exciting. What news from the hospital? Very what have you been told? Oh, very well. Very well. Dan is very well. David is very well. It was very slow, but very good. All went very well. It must have been a very... I'm very happy to be... A very historic occasion. Very historic occasion. I'm very happy to be part of it. A long and rather tense day for you waiting here, well, I think, long, isn't it? a very winding day. If you have daughters, that's the thing that happens. <laughs> have you been able to speak to Prince Charles? Yes, I've spoken to Prince Charles, yes. He's absolutely over the moon. <laughs> was he there at the time when the baby was born? So he said, yes. The Diana was absolutely wonderful. But I'll tell you, I think a very lucky baby to have a mother like Diana. That's the point, really. A lucky baby. And are you going to the hospital yourself now? Uh, sir? Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Okay. Where are you going now, sir? Can we ask? I'm um, have a beer, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Have Thank you been you able to speak? Oh, you had a long way. Oh, no. Long way. no. Have no, you been able to speak to any other members of the royal family, sir? I'll tell you, it's all absolutely delighted. Yes, I have. Have you yes. spoken to the Queen? I'll speak to the Queen, yes. She's absolutely delighted. Obviously, you haven't been able to speak to Princess Diana yet. No, no. She's, I mean, she's very well. And the baby's very well. Very are, you, sorry. are you pleased it's a boy, or did you not mind? I didn't mind. As long as it went all right, I didn't mind what it was, you know. Twins or triplets, I didn't mind what it was. Is that your first grandchild, sir? The second one. Second yeah. grandchild. I didn't mind, as long as it's all right. The, the mother's very well, the baby's very well. Go on and speak more, can you? 
for a harrowing day. And the celebration is now called for. Slow, but sure. Slow, but sure. Very well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs> Are you going to Buckingham Palace, sir, sir now? Private, private business now. But private for, affair. For a celebration private of business. some sort. <laughs> one of the grandparents. It's been a long day of waiting for everyone and both sets of grandparents-to-be in the morning were on the move. So Earl Spencer, as we've seen, came up to London to be on the spot and the Queen and Prince Philip went out of London to start with, very casually, to visit RAF Wittering in Cambridgeshire. A report on that from Martin Lewis. The smiles on the faces of the Queen and Prince Philip left no one in any doubt that the birthday most on their minds was not the 40th birthday of the RAF regiment which they'd come here to celebrate. There were flowers and questions from local school children, but the Queen wasn't giving anything away. And she knew that a special radio hotline installed in the Royal Aircraft would keep them up to date on the latest developments at the hospital. Lord Spencer, the Princess of Wales' father, said he was in close touch with the hospital too, and her father's worried. Uh, it's a poor girl, it doesn't matter at all, as long as it's a healthy baby. The baby's well done as well, that's all that matters. Later, with the Queen and the Duke back in Buckingham Palace to wait for a call from Prince Charles to tell them whether it was a boy or a girl, people began to gather to wait for the first official news of the royal birth. News that would, according to tradition, be posted on the front gates of the palace. These two youngsters were well placed to be the first to know. For the, for the baby to hear the announcement. Do you hope it's going to be a boy or a girl? A boy. Quite happy. Boy's the best? Yes. <laughs> Flag sellers sensed a few rich pickings. And patriotism appeared in all shapes and sizes, complete with bottles of champagne ready for popping. <laughs> One apparent enthusiast actually made it into the palace grounds and ended up at the wrong end of a rifle. But tonight, great celebrations at the palace. The little boy and the nation would be pleased. It was a son. But in the colonies, Spain has backtracked and says it won't end this blockade of Gibraltar. Britain says it'll still talk. A report next. Plus, supplies drop, but Stanley Airport stays closed. And in the Middle East, Israel has another go around Beirut. That's in a couple of minutes. Bad, aren't they? Who right. <laughs> yes, that hot potato's got to be in fish guard. Before lunch tomorrow, no. by Korea to the door. Husband! Don't know where to turn. No. First lift of the lights. For your nationwide and international urgent deliveries, no one does it better than Data Post. Johnson first helped keep your skin soft and smooth. Now you've grown up, Johnson and Johnson is still keeping baby soft skin, baby soft. And always will.
calling all motorcyclists. Come to Tinkler's Northumberland Street, Norwich for the complete selection of Yamaha and Honda motorcycles and full accessory service. Spain today postponed talks with Britain over the future of Gibraltar and said the frontier between the Rock and Spain would not be opened on Friday as planned. A Spanish official in Madrid said Spain was not prepared to open the border, closed by the late General Franco 13 years ago, unless Britain was ready to discuss Gibraltar in depth, and that meant discussing sovereignty. The Foreign Secretary, Mr. Pym, said he regretted the Spanish decision, but had agreed to a postponement. Events in the Falklands had affected the Spanish view, he said. Mr. Pym met the Spanish Foreign Minister in Luxembourg, where Spain's entry into the EEC was under discussion. Mr. Pym said it was inconceivable that Spain could join the community with the border closed. Spain hopes to join in 18 months' time. From Gibraltar, here's a report from David Smith. Dawn a few yards inside Gibraltar. Every morning, the same ritual. A British policeman opens the gates on his side of the border. The Spanish gates stay shut, as they've done for the past 13 years, blocking the only land route in or out. A few months ago, there was genuine enthusiasm for the reopening. But the Falklands conflict has made the Gibraltarians more defiantly British than ever. Every call from the extreme right in Spain for their army to follow the Argentine example and invade has been answered, it seems, by another flag. In short, the Falklands has made these people as wary as ever of Spanish intentions, which is why today's second postponement of the border reopening is exactly what they want. Do you want the border to open? Oh, no. Why? Like to, because we've been saying what is happening. I wouldn't mind to have it closed with a big wall like the one in Berlin. They don't like us, we don't like them. It's a problem. We never shut the frontier, they did, no? So it's up to them. Not an attitude the 800 British troops stationed here can afford to take. They're out on the governor's beach for weapons training. I'm told the army plan for defending Gibraltar was shelved as unnecessary and unthinkable just two weeks before the Falklands. Now it's been revived. David Smith, News at 10, Gibraltar. Mrs. Thatcher is going to Washington on Wednesday to talk to President Reagan about the Falklands. America said today it will not follow the EEC in lifting sanctions against Argentina until the junta confirms the ceasefire. But President Reagan is said to be anxious to repair relations with Argentina as soon as possible. Well, Mr. Pym, the Foreign Secretary, warned today it could take another day or two to get a formal ceasefire agreed by Argentina. He said, our Navy and our soldiers are still at risk. They're in a high state of vigilance and we've got to guard against that risk. In Buenos Aires, the Junta still hasn't decided on the new president to succeed General Galtieri after four days of talking about it. It's reported from there that the Air Force commanders will withdraw their support for the Junta if the army goes on insisting that one of their generals has to be president. Well, on the Falklands, Royal Engineers are continuing to clear mines laid by the Argentines and repair damage. The task force is being resupplied from Ascension Island, the British base 4,500 miles north of the Falklands. And in the past 10 weeks, there have been 13,000 flights in and out of Ascension. Since the ceasefire, Hercules transport planes have flown 10 missions from Ascension to drop supplies and mail for the troops on the Falklands. The planes have to refuel in mid-air to make the round trip. The first sight of the Falklands shows little of the damage in the fighting. But at Port Stanley Airport, the full extent of the damage can be seen. Wrecked Argentine aircraft litter the airfield. The Hercules aren't yet landing there, though the runway itself at first sight looks operable. Several craters can be seen just off the runway, but some are dummy holes, a ring of mud built by the Argentines to trick the Harrier pilot. From the air, Port Stanley appears peaceful enough. And outside the town, the Hercules crews push out huge crates of much-needed supplies. Everything going down from bags of cement to yeast for making bread. The, go 
The government's white paper on defence spending will be published tomorrow. It's been delayed for three months because of the Falklands crisis. But it's said to contain no major changes in policy, and there's likely to be fierce criticism both from Labour and many Tory backbenchers. The Navy's newest aircraft carrier, HMS Illustrious, arrived in Portsmouth today. She was completed three months ahead of time. After six weeks of sea trial, she's expected to sail for the Falklands. And the Navy's newest Type 42 destroyer, HMS York, was launched today at the Swan Hunter shipyard on Tyneside. She's armed with sea dart missiles and is the fourth of the bigger Type 42s. Two more 42 uh, type destroyers, HMS Nottingham and HMS Manchester, are still being built. Israeli tanks, artillery and gunboats heavily bombarded Palestinian positions and Lebanese residential areas in West Beirut today. They said it was in retaliation for the ambush of an Israeli patrol. Lebanese police said 36 people were killed and 82 wounded. The Palestinians said a hospital took a direct hit, killing two civilians and wounding 13, including children. The Soviet news agency TASS said its embassy had been damaged. The Israelis said they knocked out four Syrian tanks near the capital. The Israelis say they were shot at first. They claim to be respecting the ceasefire to allow for diplomatic efforts to settle the future of 6,000 Palestinian guerrillas trapped inside the city. The EEC is considering economic sanctions against Israel. We have two reports tonight, the first from Desmond Hamill. The Israelis have been moving more troops up to the outskirts of Beirut today and around the airport, sealing off the PLO in the west of the city. These are now their frontline positions in an area once controlled by the Syrians and the PLO. Well, this is Haldi, or what's left of it, once a Palestinian stronghold. The place the Israeli jets bomb day after day, pounding it into rubble. But now they say there aren't any Palestinians here at all. The devastation here is severe, not only to buildings, but also to the shanty towns that have been wiped out, leaving little sign of the numbers of people who once lived here. These troops have set up roadblocks to check all movement up and down this coast road. As streams of refugees, white flags fluttering, try and leave the city, they're checked and filtered. And so are people moving up from the south. If the last-minute diplomatic and political negotiations fail to achieve a peaceful end to the PLO as a military force, the Israelis are now ready themselves to achieve it with their army. They are here and waiting. Desmond Hamill, News at 10, on the outskirts of Beirut. Des In the affluent hills of East Beirut, there may be reminders of the fighting, but the residents are doing their best to forget it. A mile or two away, the shelling may be continuing. But here, the only danger seems to be that the woman across the table may be wearing a more expensive outfit than you are. The Israeli soldiers can hardly believe they're sitting down to lunch in an Arab capital. And down the restaurant, an even more incredible sight. Six junior ministers of Mr. Begin's government, who look as if they've come on a coach tour, not to inspect the front line in a war. What does it feel like to be eating in a restaurant in Beirut? I think it's a splendid view from one side and I'm sure that the people here are welcoming us and are very happy that the Israelis arrived to rearrange the things here and to fix the, a certain feast in the area. Over the other side of the city is a different story. Rich and poor alike, they're fleeing for their lives. Some of these people have always lived in West Beirut. Others came here from the destruction in the south only to find themselves in a situation potentially just as dangerous. It's a long wait at the checkpoint. It takes up to 48 hours of queuing to be searched and questioned by the Israelis. For the past few days, the people of West Beirut have been pouring out of the city. Here to the south, they'll be joining thousands of others who haven't got a proper roof over their heads. The toll of misery here is steadily mounting. David Walter, News at 10, Southern Lebanon. The Israeli Prime Minister, Mr. Begin, met President Reagan in Washington today. Israel's invasion of Lebanon dominated the talks. Nobody smiled much. An American official said, I don't think this is a smiley, chatty day. John Suchet saw it. When Israel invaded the Lebanon, it was thought for a time that this meeting would not happen. Such was the United States' displeasure at Israel's actions. 
But Israel is one of America's closest allies, and the opinion that prevailed at the White House was that to cancel the meeting would be escalating displeasure to outright public disapproval, which would not only deeply hurt an ally, but also contribute nothing to a peaceful solution of the conflict. Nevertheless, displeasure is certainly what President Reagan expressed to Mr. Begin at their meeting in the White House and the working lunch which followed it. No formal statements were issued afterwards, but the American position is not as hard as it perhaps was immediately after the invasion. America wants Israel to withdraw, but only in the context of a simultaneous Syrian withdrawal and greater control by the Lebanese government over the PLO. In return, President Reagan is likely to have been assured by Mr. Begin that Israeli forces will not enter Beirut itself. Mr. Reagan's rather severe look might at least in part stem from the fact that although his defense secretary and his national security advisor are both thought to have urged him to issue a public rebuke to Mr. Begin over Israel's invasion of the Lebanon, his secretary of state, Mr. Hayes, is known to have favored a softer approach. It's a conflict within the administration here that Mr. Begin is certain to have exploited in his talks with the president. John Suchet, News at 10, in Washington. Two provisional IRA men have been arrested and charged in New York for trying to buy five red-eye surface-to-air missiles for use against British Army helicopters in Northern Ireland. Unfortunately for them, they tried to buy them from undercover FBI agents, believing the missiles were stolen from Russia. The two men were apparently prepared to pay $10,000 for each missile. They told the FBI they had a million dollars to spend. The government has increased its pay offer to nurses and health workers, but the biggest health union, NUPI, has turned it down. The strike plan for Wednesday is still on, a report in part three. Also, David Frost is divorcing the former Mrs. Peter Sellers. And Wimbledon has started with a little rain and a few surprises, but McEnroe is safely through. In a couple of minutes. This is what you've been asking me for over the last few months. The Atari video game. And Space Invaders. Thanks, Dad. Let's see how long that keeps you amused. Discover the new Atari video computer system. 45 cartridges containing over 700 challenging, absorbing, and educational games. Dad, I'm beginning to get a bit bored with this. Typical. You never stick with anything long. <laughs> In 1935, one airline stood poised, ready to challenge the Pacific, Pan Am. Pan Am also invented luxury in the skies. And they've never forgotten it. In first class on a transatlantic 747, all its space and privacy. In clipper class, the business traveler has room to think and work. And this is cabin class. No scheduled airline gives you better value across the Atlantic. You can now experience Pan Am non-stop from London to seven U.S. cities with connections all over America. Pan Am, you can't beat the experience. Choosing the right color is as easy as choosing Crown Match Pot. At just 25p a go, you can try them out at home, and when you buy the big can, you get your money back. Crown Match Pot, great little idea. Great range of colors. That's why you're more at home with Brown. The nurses and the hospital workers have had a new pay offer. After five hours of talks with the Social Services Secretary, Mr. Norman Fowler, the union said the nurses' 6.4% offer had been increased to 7%, and the ancillary workers' 4% had been raised to 5.5%. But the union said it wasn't enough to meet their 12% claim. There'll be more talks tomorrow, but Wednesday's strike in health service is to go ahead. Here's our industrial editor, Giles Smith. Union leaders whose strikes have so disrupted the health service over the last month were tight-lipped as they left tonight's talks with Mr. Fowler. They clearly thought that having moved the government a little, they could even move them even further in tomorrow's talks. Their leader, Mr. Albert Fanswick of Cozy, said... Of course, 55 and 7% isn't enough. We're still pressing for 12%. So the industrial action the unions have been mounting has moved the government. Not much so far. But the unions obviously believe they have ministers worried. Despite the distractions of the Falklands, the unions believe there's widespread public support for the hospital workers. 
The government's problem is that with more and more workers striking in sympathy with the hospital workers, miners, transport workers and civil servants are due to come out on Wednesday, the dispute could soon get out of hand. The fact that other workers are openly flouting the government's new laws on secondary picketing is also an embarrassment. So it does look as though Mr Fowler wants to settle the dispute, although it may take some days of hard bargaining before he moves to a figure the unions can accept. The government is dropping its controversial plan to withdraw supplementary benefits from unemployed school leavers who refuse to go on the new job training scheme next year. The unions and employers have said the plan amounted to job conscription. The Employment Secretary, Mr Norman Tebbit, admitted today that the scheme could be seriously impaired if it was compulsory. The marriage of David Frost and Lynn Frederick, the widow of Peter Sellers, has just ended after 18 months. The friend of the couple said today they were divorced last week. They were married in January last year, six months after Peter Sellers died. Today's statement said no third party was involved in the divorce, and it said the two stay close friends. Wimbledon started today with some rain, fewer spectators, and seeds falling by the wayside. Andres Gomez of Ecuador, seeded nine, went down in four sets to Stan Smith. Yannick Noah of France, seeded ten, didn't get on court. He withdrew with a thigh injury. The top four men seeds, however, got through in straight sets. The champion, John McEnroe, on his best behavior, beat a fellow American, Van Winitsky, 6-2, 6-2, 6-1, our sports correspondent, Ian Edwards, watched the match. Winitsky and everyone else knew that his was a lost cause. There was never any doubt as to who would come out on top, though Winitsky did have his moments of success. And on his own service, Winitsky knew how to make his point. But such defiance wasn't allowed to last long. Game, set, match, match. So the defending champion and number one seed marches through to the second round in a fairly civilized manner. Following on center court for the first time was the young man who may one day succeed to his title, the 17-year-old Mats Wilander from Sweden, who was a surprise winner of the French championships last month. He had his moments of hesitation and dropped a set before beating the Swiss Heinz Gunthard. But though he's had a remarkable run of victories, he said afterward he wasn't thinking about winning Wimbledon this year, because it took a long time to get used to the grass. Ian Edwards, ITN Sport, at Wimbledon. Soccer in the World Cup in Group 5, Northern Ireland have drawn with Honduras, one all. Gerald Sinstadt is the commentator. Second chance. So this was the scene just a few minutes ago as the crowds and the Union Jacks waved outside Buckingham Palace. One all in today's other matches in Group 2, Austria beat Algeria 2-0. In Group 4, from which England are already certain to go through, France beat Kuwait 4-1. That match was stopped towards the end when the Kuwaitis protested very forcibly about what would have been the French fourth goal. The referee was manhandled, a number of non-players and police came onto the pitch, including the president of the Kuwait Football Federation, Sheikh Fahd al-Ahmad al-Sabah, no less. And the Kuwaitis did it. The referee apparently overawed, changed his mind, and disallowed the goal. Well, England will pay Kuwait on Friday. What will the fans do then? 
in case you hadn't heard, the Princess of Wales had a baby boy tonight. Outside Buckingham Palace, the birth of the royal baby was announced in the traditional manner. A palace official accompanied by a police sergeant placed a notice on the main gate. Anthony Carthew was there and reports. And so this was the scene just a few minutes ago. The crowd, the Union Jack, an enormous amount of enthusiasm. The gates were closed, that's the tradition. And then the sergeant very carefully put the notice in place. A very careful sergeant, this one. Careful to hold it upright and in the right place. And these are the words that people wanted to see. It had been typed out well in advance, signed by four doctors. The last name on the list, Mr. George Pinker, the gynecologist who delivered the baby. Not all could read that. They didn't seem to mind because, in fact, the whole thing had been established well and truly. And so, at the end of the whole thing, they shouted, We want the Queen. We want the Queen. We want the Queen. Plenty of Union Jacks, and rightly, the last word from Sarah Cullen outside St Mary's Hospital. Well, in the past half hour, the crowd's been getting even more enthusiastic, if that's possible. They've been waving champagne bottles, and a lot of people have been soaked in champagne. There's been more cheering and shouting, and they're clearly not going home until they've seen Prince Charles. Well, as far as we know, the prince is still inside with his wife and baby boy, and the hospital says it's unlikely he'll leave tonight. But try telling that to this cheerful and noisy crowd. They're determined to wait it out. Sarah Cullen, News at 10, St. Mary's, Paddington. And so, it is a boy, it is a new prince. And that's what the country has waited for all day. The Queen waited for it, Prince Charles was there, and of course the Princess of Wales. And the palace said as the day went on, well, it's quite normal, the first child is like this. Don't worry, it's going to be all right. And the final statistic to show it is all right, the new prince weighed seven pounds, one and a half ounces. And that's the news tonight. Good night.